Order members, the sitting is resumed and it's time now for questions to the Minister for Education. We will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Maeve McLaughlin. Um, following the uh, Health Minister's announcement today on the inquiry into child sexual exploitation, can I ask the Minister uh, what communication has taken place um, from the Department of Health with the Department of Education and has he actually now agreed to the terms of reference for the child sexual abuse inquiry? Um, the communications between both departments, I have to say, has been poor. Uh, I have been informed largely through the media in relation to both the establishment of the inquiry, uh, that the Minister was hoping to involve the Education and Training Inspectorate, I found out through the media, and I was informed at the same time as all other members this morning in relation to the Minister's statement. I now have a copy of the terms of reference. I will study the terms of reference and then respond to the Health Minister in due course. I call Maeve McLaughlin for supplementary. Well, good, and I thank the Minister for that uh, clarification. Uh, can I ask also, in, in moving forward, one of the issues is about ensuring that the voice of children and young people is included in the inquiry, uh, what the Minister can do to ensure that those voices are heard throughout this process? Well, I, I want to ensure that the, the, the heart of the inquiry has to be about the protection of children. It has to be about protecting the most vulnerable children in our society, those children in care. And clearly, I am keen to play a, a positive role in an in inquiry going forward and ensure that the lessons are learned of the past. If there was mistakes made in the past, that those responsible uh, are held to account for that and that we protect our children going forward. In several consultations carried out to date by my own department, we have included children. We have used the offices of the Children's Commissioner in particular to ensure that the voices of children are heard. And I will be studying the terms of reference uh, with a viewpoint to ensuring that the children affected uh, and the children in care, there is a mechanism for their voices to be heard throughout this inquiry. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got a last one, Corla. Uh, could I ask the Minister to give an update on his uh, department's fundamental review of uh, GCSEs and A-levels and confirm that the recent announcement by Ofqual in London or in England relates to England only? Um, I, I launched a consultation process, uh, I think it was the 30th of September, I spoke to the House in relation to a report carried out by SIA in relation to the qualifications we conduct here. The recent announcements by Ofqual do only affect what is happening in England. Uh, neither affects our jurisdictions or Wales, and indeed Scotland has its own exam system. I call Pat Sheen. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I wonder, uh, is the Minister confident that we can retain a robust and transferable qualification system in the north of Ireland here, irrespective of what happens in England? Uh, I, I remain very confident that we can do so. We have a consultation ongoing at the moment. Uh, it follows on from the SEA report. That report found that there was not an appetite for, uh, to follow the, the examples of England at this stage. Uh, the consultation has put a number of options out to both education and indeed the wider community in relation to the direction of travel for exams going forward. But I am very confident that we will continue to have robust exams taking place in our society and that those exams will be able to be transportable and hold currency uh, regardless of where the student or the potential employee wishes to travel. I call Jerry Kelly. Is the Minister aware of the latest uh, report from the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission in Britain and what, has to, what it has to say about the narrow and the achievement gap and uh, resources which are needed towards deprived and uh, uh, low attaining pupils? Uh, I, I am aware of the Child Poverty and Social Mobility Commission's first annual State of the Nation report, which details its assessments of child poverty and social mobility in Great Britain and the efforts of the English, Welsh and Scottish governments in this regard. Uh, whilst the report does not include an assessment of the position here, the Commission's recommendations to raise the bar and standards and close the gap in attainment for lower attainers from both low and average income families are of particular relevance to my department and indeed have been of particular relevance to the ongoing debate about the Common Funding Formula Review. I call Jerry Kelly for some uh, of the um, 
Could the Minister maybe talk about other factors, or are there other factors which contribute uh, to the gap in educational attainment, um, as well as the socio-economic uh, conditions? Uh, yes, though uh, both local studies and international studies show that the, the, the single most determining factor of a child's educational outcome is its socio-economic background. But we have to challenge that. We have to resource our schools to be able to uh, face up to that challenge. But also, uh, we have to encourage communities and families to become re-involved in their children's education. There is far too many examples of where families or parents have had bad educational experiences themselves. They then are reluctant to, or not equipped to, become involved in their child's education. We have to correct that, and we have a number of community projects, uh, or community funding initiatives, uh, which are enabling parents and families to do just that. We want to ensure that the greatest determining factor in the school is the quality of teacher in the classroom, is the quality of leadership in the principal's office. And we are very, very lucky that we have many, many highly qualified and dedicated school leaders and teachers in our classrooms, and we have to continue to improve on that and learn lessons from that mm -hmm. as well. But the socio-economic background of a child is the single biggest determining factor at this stage in our society of determining the child's outcome, and we have to face up to that challenge. Can I remind members and ministers that uh, questions and answers should be addressed through the chair? Uh, can I call Michael McCoupland? Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister for his assessment of the progress made by Dundonald High School towards achieving its own set goals and the implication of that for the uh, continuance of the school? Um, it's quite clear that there has been strides forward in Dundonald High School, both through a combination of the dedication of the senior management team the involvement of the local community, and I refer to local communities taking ownership of their schools, mm. and that process has clearly taken part in Dundonald. I have to make a decision in relation to development proposals affecting uh, East Belfast and parts of South Belfast, which include Dundonald High School. And I have to, one of the questions I am deliberating, deliberating on is this: Has the turnaround in the school taken place in time to ensure that there is a sustainable future for the school? I call Michael Copeland. Um, I, I thank the Minister for his, his encouraging words. Um, could he further inform me that, that, that the ingredients would be necessary to assist him in taking that decision? One of the reasons for the delay has been that there, during the, the pre-consultation period, uh, the Belfast Board did not consult schools affected by some of the proposals within the South Eastern Education Library Board's proposals. That has now been rectified. Uh, and those, they, those discussions came to conclusions in around late September. My department officials are now analysing all the data in relation to this. And I, I, I understand and I appreciate uh, the frustrations of the schools involved that the decision has, been, has not been made yet. But I want to make the right decision. I want to make a decision which is long term and gives certainty to the community in, affected by these decisions of the. the geographical location of schools going into the future and the quality of those schools going into the future. I call Michael McGimsey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, uh, in terms of the provision of a new consolidated primary school in South Belfast, uh, Fane Street, Donegal Road and Sandy Row, uh, another major milestone has been reached with planning permission being granted for the application from the Belfast Board for this uh, uh, construction. Uh, could the Minister indicate when he sees this project going on to his capital programme? Um, we are continuing to engage with the uh, five education library boards and CCMS in relation to the next announcement around the capital bills programme. Uh, I hope to be in a position in January, February time to make a further announcement uh, to the Assembly about further programme of bills going into the future. Uh, and I will keep in mind uh, the issues raised by the member in relation to the, the schools around South Belfast. And I accept there has been uh, delays in the past. I accept that expectations have been arisen within that community over a new build programme. But I want to make sure, whatever announcements I make, that it is definitive that the school building will go ahead and within a reasonable time frame. So we are continuing to work on it, and I hope to make an announcement in the January, February time. 
I call Michael McJimson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer, which, uh, again, I see uh, as very encouraging. Uh, uh, and just to uh, reiterate uh, what he has said, are we actually saying now that the new consolidated primary school will be in the, the mix as far as uh, the allocation uh, of cap at the capital programme stage will be uh, when, it, when it's made? In other words, that our, hat, our, our, our name is now in the hat. Um, there is quite a significant number of names in the hut. Um, I can assure the member that when I'm making my deliberations about a, a, an announcement around schools, that uh, the schools and the amalgamation she refers to will uh, be in my considerations. And I'm acutely aware, both through his representations and other members' representations, about the needs and the need to move on in relation to confirming a, a building programme for that area. I call Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister for his Department's assessment on the sharing mobile classrooms for P6 and P7 um, pupils at Ashgrove Primary School in Newton Abbey? Um, I, I don't have it. I, I, I missed part of the sound. Doesn't seem to be quite good. It's an assessment of the sharing of mobile classrooms for P6 and P7s. I don't have an assessment in, in regards to that matter. If the member wishes to write to me and give me more detail in regards to the subject, then I would happily correspond with her indeed our meter on, on the issue. Uh, Pam Brown again. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer and appreciate that he has in the background information here. Um, it's just given that you know I'm sure the, the Minister does appreciate that each class requires their own classroom. Um, where they can receive the tailored teaching that they actually deserve. And uh, I'd be happy to follow up with the Minister and be keen to see if and could we have a question, please? amenable to um, additional funding being available to the school so that they can um, end the practice of sharing a mobile. Um, during the last uh, announcement around building programmes, one of the issues we did take into account was uh, when considering eligibility for announcement was schools with a high percentage of accommodation within mobile classrooms. I, and I don't have the details about the school you refer to, and I haven't finalised the criteria which we will use for the next announcement either. But we clearly want to take our young people out of mobile classrooms and put them into permanent structures moving forward. Uh, a significant number of our schools do uh, have composite classes in the sense that they share P6, P7 and, and, and other classes. It depends on the numbers of pupils at the schools. Some schools it suits to do that in terms of the numbers they have. But I certainly don't want to see a large concentration of pupils in any classroom, and I want to move forward to ensure that our, our accommodation for our children is fit for the 21st century. I call Chris Hazard. Can I ask the Minister to give an update on the Delivering Social Change Numeracy and Literacy uh, project, which involves the recruitment of uh, recently graduated teachers? Um, the the programme is moving forward well. It has been a huge task to take forward. And it is an example, I have to say, of when our executive and our, our different ministries work well together. We deliver change for the communities we serve. Currently, as of the 25th of October, there were 209 full-time equivalent teachers appointed out of a total of 273 teaching posts for the First and Deputy First Minister's DE schemes. Uh, we continue to, uh, the schools continue to advertise. There is continuing to be interviews taking place in terms of delivering and in putting newly qualified teachers into post, but it has been a very successful scheme. I have met a number of the appointees on my visits to a number of schools. Their enthusiasm is clear, and the delight of the schools being able to appoint newly qualified teachers is clear as well. I call Chris Hazard. Um, it certainly sounds like the scheme has got off to a very positive start, and if indeed this is the case uh, for the duration, is it the Minister's intention to extend um, the scheme? It will certainly be one of those schemes which I would like to be approaching the First and Deputy First Minister in the future, uh, if there are further funds available through the Developing Social Change Programme to increase the number of newly qualified teachers we are using through this scheme. Indeed, my own department I have put in place 2.3 million to expand the scheme for another 36 teachers to be put in place. So it, it is a, seem, a scheme that has been warmly received by our schools and by the newly qualified teachers, and it is a scheme that is making a real difference in young people's lives out there. And as I say, it's an example of when the executive works well together, how we can make a difference in young people's lives. Lord Morrow is not in his place. David McElveen is not in his place, and I call Fergal McKinney. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and uh, can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister for any update on flexibility of school starting age? Um, I have asked my officials to come forward to me with proposals on how we introduce a flexibility into the school starting age. Uh, we, well, we do have a very uh, young starting age for our schools. I believe that the foundation stage allows our young people to develop at an appropriate rate and stage uh, within the appropriate education for their age group. Officials are currently examining proposals in relation to exceptions within the flexibility of school starting age, where parents can identify that a child is too young to start school, in their opinion. That we, one of the examples that has been used in the Scottish Borders area is that there is a panel established and that evidence is presented to the panel about the ability and needs of the child at that age and whether it should or should not be allowed to attend school at the regulated school starting age. So I'm looking at that to see if we can introduce a similar system here where parents who are concerned about the ability of their child to start school at the regulated starting age may be allowed to hold the child back for a year either in nursery provision or through some form of home tutoring. And that is the end to topical questions, and we move on to oral questions that have been listed. Questions number one and fourteen have been withdrawn. Alex Maskey is not in his place. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question three, Minister. Um, I agreed to extend the consultation on the proposed changes to the common funding scheme for a further week until the 25th of October 2013. I am delighted with the outcome of the consultation. For the record, over 14,000 responses have been received, 3,000 of those from young people. I would like to thank all of those who took time to respond to this very important consultation. I will take my time to study the response before announcing how the final changes to the formula will be incorporated and what effect the additional £15.8 million will have on each school's budget. The core principle of my proposals to break the link between social deprivation and educational outcome has not been challenged, and even by my political detractors. The fact remains that those schools with higher levels of social deprivation face the biggest challenges. Therefore, they require more resources to tackle those challenges. I have been accused by some of taking money off schools to give to other schools. However, no school's annual budget is confirmed until it is done so by my department. Therefore, the monies I plan to use are not any individual schools. They are from my department's central aggregated schools budget of £1.1 billion and will be, as in any year, distributed under the common funding scheme when confirmed by me. The proposed changes to the common funding scheme for 2014 will, when confirmed, see more money from the aggregated schools budget going to schools with higher levels of social deprivation. We, as an executive, and indeed as a society as a whole, are either serious about tackling inequality and social disadvantage or we are not. I am serious about it. The programme for government commits me to do so. I call Dolores Kelly. Well, I uh, certainly welcome the Minister's commitment to tackling social deprivation, but I'm at a loss to understand how taking money from T uh, St. Teresa's and Tannock Moor and Drum Creek College, and, uh, which is in the heart of his own constituency and in areas of so social deprivation, is actually going to work. So the Minister said about the £15.4 million. Is that a one-off injection of cash? And how are schools going to respond uh, the following year in relation to their budget? Are they to work month for month or a hand out in the begging bowl to the department? Um, St. Teresa's and Tannock Moor, those are the two new schools I'm building. <laughs> Brand new builds for both schools. Those, those schools. There is. Um, the member in her question states um, the community anger out there. There's something related Order. to anger. Anger is in the word somewhere, in the question somewhere. Sorry. Can the minister write? I haven't got the question in front of me, but the question relates to the word anger. Maybe people get angry when they meet her. But I have found that throughout this consultation that speaking to educationalists, speaking to pupils, speaking to principals, speaking to parents, speaking to people interested in social justice and equality, that they approach me in a rational manner, that they have rational discussions with me, and they put upon point, point, point their point of view in a very rational, considered manner. Some agree with my proposals, some do not agree with my proposals. But as I said in my original question to you, 
and perhaps the SDLP are going to challenge on me on this, that social deprivation is the biggest indicator of a child's educational outcomes, and that needs to be challenged. A school with high levels of social deprivation therefore requires more funding to ensure that they have the resources available to give equality to all children they are there to serve. Now, if the SDLP are opposed to that, they need to state why they're opposed to it. If they're opposed to my uh, common funding formula proposals, they need to come forward with alternatives. I have read their submission to the common funding formula review. I do not see any alternatives with them. I call Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, um, and I have to say, Minister, you're not actually winning the argument out there in the schools. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the common funding formula, what would his attitude be, what will his attitude be, when every school principal at primary and special school level in a constituency rejects the common funding formula on the principle that they do not wish to see one school be advantaged over another school who would be a loser. That, uh, that scenario is actually in place. The scenario you paint for me is in place because the numbers of our schools have an advantage over other schools who are at a disadvantage. And those schools that are at disadvantage are those schools with high concentrations of children with free, free school meals. All the evidence points us towards that. Now, I haven't heard an outcry from any of the benches when that was taking place. I haven't heard an outcry from any of the benches when a child in free school meals is 50% less likely to succeed in education than a child that is not on free school meals. That's what should be annoying people. That's what should be getting people angry. That's what should be concentrating people's minds. And I am not taking money off an individual school to give to another school. This money is coming out of the Department of Education's budget, the aggregated schools budget of £1.1 billion. It is a matter for the Department of Education, after consultation, to decide how that money is best spent. The programme for government sets very stringent targets for me in relation to children on free school meals. The programme for government tells me I have to increase the educational attainment for these young people. The programme for government in its opening paragraph also states that we have to tackle social disadvantage. Now, we can produce glossy documents and distribute them to the public. We can talk about tackling social disadvantage or we can do something about it. I intend to do something about it. I call Michaela Boyle. Can I ask the Minister, is he, still make, is he still confident of making the required changes before the, uh, uh, the start of the new financial year? Yes, I am. I believe it's important that the changes will be made. The consultation response is 14,000, 3,000 of those from young people, 11,000 from interested individuals, schools and parties out there. They will all be given due consideration. They will be sought, they will be um, reviewed, particularly seeking out alternatives, particularly to seek out unexpected consequences of any changes to the formula and to see to ensure that the objectives of my proposals are met and that the objectives of my proposals do not have unintended consequences. The figures schools are currently working on do not take into account the £15.8 million pound which is to be injected to the system. And Mrs Kelly asked, is that a one-off payment? The funding uh, confirmed for the Department of Education runs up to 1415. Beyond that, we're into negotiations with the rest of the Executive College in relation to funding for education. Now, I hope and I would expect that those negotiations will ensure that funding is increased to education, because if we are going to tackle social disadvantage and if we are going to grow the economy, then education has to succeed. I call Megan Fearon. Thank you. Kesh Deborah Cahar, question four. The school enhancement programme is, in, is designed to enable the refurbishment or extension of existing schools, and recently I announced that 51 schools have been informed that their applications have been successful at the first stage of assessment. These projects have been demonstrated to be consistent with emerging area plans and the schools have been asked to prepare economic appraisals as part of the next stage of the assessment process. Decisions on funding will be made when economic appraisals for the selected pro projects have been assessed. It is anticipated that these decisions will be made in the new year. The scale of the potential investment in the SEP underlines my continu continuing commitment to improving the school's estate. 
I call Megan Fearham for supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. And can I ask him to explain and outline some of the reasons as to why there were 16 um, of the applications that were deemed unsuccessful? Um, there were numerous reasons why several of the applications did not go through and all did not meet the criteria. That when there was a, an established criteria against which these projects were judged against. Unfortunately, 16 did not meet the criteria. I hope to be in a position, and I am reviewing my capital budget, I hope to be in a position uh, in the early part of next year to announce another tranche of funding under the school enhancement programme. And it is open to those schools who were torn down this time to reapply if they believe they will meet the criteria going forward, or indeed schools that, that did not apply this time to uh, apply going into the future. I call Mervyn's story. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. What assurance can the Minister give to those schools who had been on a capital bill project, but then, because of either the board, uh, for example, in Clare and Interest, as a, a board of governors of Ballymoney High School, uh, that that school in particular now will receive money under the school enhancement programme, but that then means that their new build is now under serious uh, jeopardy? What assurance can the Minister give? that new bills will not be displaced as a result of them being successful in relation to the School Enhancement Programme? Well, well, the Member will appreciate that each case will have to be looked at on its own merits. And a number of the programmes or projects which have been agreed under the School Enhancement Programme are hopeful of new bills going into the future, but there needed to be immediate works carried out to those schools to ensure that the children within those schools are being, were being taught in the proper environment. And we, I think it is only right and proper that we make investments, and quite significant investments, even if it is for the short to medium period of time, to ensure that young people are being taught in proper premises. So each case will have to be judged on its own merits. Um, a number of schools that have applied for the School Enhancement Programme have decided that it is a, the way ahead for them instead of a new build programme. And that's their decision to make, and schools will make similar decisions perhaps in the future. But that's each, as I say, each case will be judged on its own merits. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the minister tell us when he will produce a transparent matrix of all planned investments and indeed the hierarchy of those projects contained in that matrix? I would suggest I have. Uh, each time I make an announcement in relation to capital build programmes, I announce those programmes that have been successful and I announce the matrix against which they have been judged. Um, of course, I understand that when a school is not on the list, they will be deeply disappointed, and there may be a variety of reasons why a school is not made, it, including, I have to say, that we do not have enough money within the capital build programmes within our schools as state to move forward. We were somewhere in the region of £400 million was taken off us by the Tory government when they came into power in terms of school capital programme. That has had a, a, a significant impact on our ability to deliver new build programmes. But I would certainly argue that we, do, we are open and transparent as to how and why uh, we select schools for new capital builds programmes. I call Karen McKevitt. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? And I would like to um, pursue a wee bit more on a previous answer where you spoke about the 16 schools that uh, did not meet the criteria. Can I ask the Minister, is, an appeal, is there an appeals mechanism for schools that thought they did make the criteria within uh, the um, enhanced uh, programme uh, like St Louis and Kilkeel? Well, no, there is not uh, an appeals mechanism. Uh, the criteria is there and we judge it against the criteria. I am not going to go into on the floor of the House specific individual schools. Uh, but perhaps the member would like to ask herself why she believes St. Louis and Kilkeel meets the criteria. Mm -hmm. I call Stephen Mutry. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question five. Uh, while a 14 to 19 school is clearly one that operates within a two tier system of junior and senior high schools, there is no official or legal definition of a bilateral school. It is a term that is used by schools in the descriptions of themselves, but can mean different things for different schools. Some schools that use this term operate a partially selective admissions process for pupils. Others use non-academic criteria to admit pupils and stream them on the basis of a test once they are in the school. I call Stephen Mitry. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Given the Minister's answer and the fact that this type of school does not successfully exist anywhere in Northern Ireland, can the Minister explain what evidence there is 
that such a school will improve and enhance the educational performance in the Dixon Plan area, which is above the Northern Ireland average currently? Um, I'm not sure. There may not be another 14 to 19 bilateral schools, but there are certainly bilateral schools out there, and they're very successful. Uh, very successful in their delivery of education to all the young people they serve. In relation to if the Southern Education Library Board come forward with uh, an option as outlined in relation to a 14 to 19 bilateral school, all the evidence in relation as to whether that school will be able to deliver uh, high quality education to all the young people, uh, it serves will be taken into account for any decision is made. I call Pat Sheehan. For my other last con, Corla. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the current educational arrangements in the Dixon Plan area do not meet the growing needs of our children and young people? Uh, I would agree. I believe that there needs to be a fundamental re overhaul of the Dixon Plan to ensure that all the young people in that area are served uh, with high quality education and with high quality educational facilities. Uh, currently, I believe that it creates an inequality within our education system which is completely unacceptable. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, nowhere else in the world does a bilateral school in the 14 to 19 age range exist, so I am struggling to see on what sound evidence such a proposal could have been based. Can you assure us that when the SELB are forced to remove option A, that your department will not interfere and force a new system until agreement is reached amongst the schools involved. It's a big statement. Nowhere else in the world does a 14 to 19 year old bilateral school exist. I hope the member can stand over that statement. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with her, but it is a very big statement, <laughs> considering the diverse education systems that exist throughout the globe. Um, very few places in the world, I have to say, and I can stand over this, <laughs> very few places in the world select children and then divide them up into different schools at post-primary level. The most successful e economies in the world don't do it. The most successful education systems, which are related to the most successful economies in the world, do, do not do it. So I'm at a bewilderment as to why the member continues to insist that you have to divide children up into different schools, whether that be at the age of 11 or at the age of 14. There's no evidence uh, to support her analysis in relation to that. But however, in relation to, and I, I, I note the term the member used, when the SELB is forced to remove the proposal, that reflects some of the language and the actions which are taking place in the debate within the Greater Craig Avon area. Forced. People are feeling intimidated by the actions of those who claim by those who claim to support the Dixon Plan. Parents have come to me feeling uh, concerned that their voices are not allowed to be heard. Speakers at prize giving nights are hackled from the floor because they dare to speak of a different opinion than those who support the current Dixon Plan. Teachers, members of boards of governors, principals are all facing significant pressure from those who support the Dixon Plan not to open their mouths. So let's not use force. Let's use reasonable argument to win the day. Let's use evidence to win the day. And let's be prepared to stand up for all the young people in the Dixon Plan rather than the few. I call Peter Weir. Uh, question of number six, Mr Deputy Speaker. My department has identified the most effective indicator of social deprivation among uh, pupils uh, should have the following characteristics. It, uh, it needs to relate to information that is personal to the pupil's family circumstances. That information needs to be capable of independent validation. It needs to be up to date. It needs to be capable, capable of being updated on an annual basis. And it needs to be easily gathered at school level. Free school meal entitlement is the only reliable measure we have been able to identify that meets these requirements. The view of the independent review panel was that free school meal entitlement provides an indication of the relative concentration of potentially disadvantaged pupils in a given school in a way that no other indicator currently does. Additionally, statistical analysis shows a strong correlation between the entitlement to free school meals and the multiple deprivation measures. 
I remain open to hearing suggestions as to other indicators that might be, meet these characteristics I have just outlined. To date, I have received no suggestions that do this. I call Peter Weir. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, but in light of the recommendation that was there that the Department should look at alternatives, what alternatives has the Department looked at in relation to free school meals? And does the Minister believe that in light of his response, the Warnock factor should be reinstated into the budget? One of the elements I'm looking at as part of the consultation responses is the Warnock element. Uh, that has been raised with me by, uh, both at a personal level by principals and teachers and as part of the consultation responses. So we'll certainly look at that. Free school meals. Those who stand up and criticise free school meals have not given me a valid reason to date as to why they're ineffective. They identify the individual child. They identify the circumstances of that child. And you can monitor them on a yearly basis. Now, no one, apart from a comment about the Bristol University report, which Bristol University report refers to the English system, and our free school means entitlement is much broader and wide-ranging than the English system. And indeed, the Bristol report refers to that we should use working tax credits as an identifier. Our free school means system does use working tax credits as an identifier of social needs. So somebody needs to come forward with a reason why free school means are not the best indicator for the individual child and the broader circumstances. They identify the individual child, and when you see the correlation between significant numbers of children with free school meals and those areas of higher social deprivation, there are clearly indicates that both are matched. So if somebody come forward with a valid reason not to use free school meals, rather than <laughs> what I have heard thus far is rumours, innuendo, and this one said it, and that one said it. No one has come forward with a research piece of paper saying our free school meals entitlement is the wrong way forward. I call Sean Rogers. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answer so far. Could I ask the Minister, has he considered the South East Regional College's um, study in measuring social deprivation as maybe something that would complement uh, the free school meals index? I'm not aware of the South East Regional College's report into this matter. Uh, if the member wishes to share it with me or send on more information to me, I'd be happy uh, to read it and, and to take a look at it. Uh, but again, um, it would have to follow the characteristics I have set out there, that it identifies the individual child, that it can be annually reviewed, uh, and that it, um, it is information that is capable of independent validation. If those characteristics can be matched. If it matches uh, our ability to identify social need, then I will take a very close look at it. I call Chris Hazard. Go on, Margaret. Last can call you go on Berkeley Schlesinera. Can the Minister confirm for me, uh, and I, I have this feeling that after all the, the shouting that takes place from the opposite branches, can the Minister confirm if indeed any other political party in this House have presented him with any other option other than free school meals? Go on, Margaret. I have, I have Order. studied, I have studied uh, the five political parties' responses to the Common Funding Formula Scheme and none have yet presented me with an option in relation to their... To Order, please. No, none, none of the political parties have presented me with an alternative to free school meals, and I assume all the political parties are more than happy to publish their responses. So, so publish your responses, and if and the member across the way is saying I'm speaking absolute nonsense, then people can study his response and then say, well, has he presented the minister with an alternative? And they'll make up their own mind in regards to that matter. But no one, the most important thing is this, no one has been able to come forward and say why they're opposed to free school meals. No one has been able to come forward and give a valid reason as to why they're so vehemently opposed to free school meals. And indeed, it's worth noting that in 2006, when a direct rule minister introduced a targeting social need formula as a result of work Martin McGuinness had done during his term in office, and it was only a minor increment for free school meals and a min minor increment for targeting social need, the DUP objected there. The DUP, through their education spokesperson, Sammy Wilson, objected on that occasion as well. So they would, I read the statement from Sammy Wilson. That's how I know. You know it's called the Order. I read the statement from Sammy Wilson. So the, there's parties in this chamber who lean to the right, and perhaps that gives their philosophy around free school meals. But there's parties in this chamber who lean to the left. 
There's parties in this chamber who have Social Democrat in their title, and they would need to come forward as to why they're so opposed to targeting free school meals. I call order, order, order members. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask number, question number seven to the Minister, please? Sorry, I couldn't hear with Gregory grumbling in the background. Mm. So, so <laughs> I got used to it a long time ago. <laughs> order, members. I would ask members to be respectful to other members in the chamber. Minister. Yeah. I, I think it used to, it used to grumble but never share power with you, and then you did share power with us. Uh, uh, do you remember that grumble? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember grumbling but never share power with you? But there you are, sharing power with us. Uh, yeah. My aim is to have the remaining stages of the education bill completed in the coming weeks. However, I need agreement from my executive colleagues to bring forward the Education and Skills Authority bill. I cannot do this matter on my own. If the bill is not brought forward within the next number of weeks, we will not reach our programme for government commitment to establish the ESA in 2013. I call Kieran McCarthy. I thank the Minister for his reply. But does the Minister accept that the, the lack of a fully functional educational skills authority um, means that uh, the area planning is actually happening uh, on an ad hoc basis? And what impact will this have on the overall school funding? No, I do not accept area planning as happening on an ad hoc basis. The five education and library boards, CCMS, uh, the integrated sector and the Irish medium sector are all involved in the strategic planning of um, area planning. So it's not going to impact that on that basis. But the fact is this, ACE is a programme for government commitment. I hear comments from the members on the bench opposite, but they're glad it isn't moving forward. Why did they sign up to the programme for government? Mm -hmm. Now, there's two issues we've found out today in relation to targeting social need. You're not that fussed on that either. And now they're, they're, they're hackling me from the benches opposite, saying they're happy. They're happy. They're happy that ESA is not moving forward. Another programme for government commitment that they signed up to, that they committed to, and now they're saying they're happy isn't going ahead. I call order. Order, members. Order. Order, members. Does a member wish to be named? I call Cahill Boylan. Could I thank you and thank the Minister for his answers, but could I ask the Minister, could he outline the importance of the proposed Education and Skills Authority? The Education and Skills Authority was designed to modernise the management of our education system, which dates back to 1973. We have in fairness to five education and library boards who, through a period of quite difficult times, provided education in our society. That management style is now outdated, having a 35-person uh, board to run uh, our education system five times over doesn't make sense. We have a number of structures which are no longer required and would be more effective and more efficient if we brought them in under one umbrella. That's what the parties agreed to, and that's the reason the parties agreed to the programme for government commitment. Uh, to establish ESA in 2013, and it's up to them to explain now why they believe that to be no longer relevant. There are significant savings to be made if ESA is brought into play, and that those savings can be redirected into frontline education. Another very topical issue, considering the alleged concerns of some members around funding going towards schools, I would much prefer to use the £20 million we could save from ESA annually in frontline education services. Perhaps some members believe that keeping their fellow councillors on education boards is a more effective way of spending that money. Yeah. I call Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. Uh, could the Minister confirm if the uh, Education Skills Authority proposals are part of any internal discussion with the First and Deputy First Minister at present in and around uh, that deal or indeed any other deals that may be proposed? That's a question best placed with the OFMD. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, I would like to ask Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I ask um, Could I ask the Minister how much has been spent so far on the exercise to establish the ESA? Um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but there's been too much spent on it. Because not only was ESA in this programme for government, it was in the last programme for government. 
And when a commitment is made in a programme for government, there is then a duty on the relevant minister to prepare for that commitment to be met. And both uh, Minister Ryan at other time and then myself have both lived up to our commitments under the programme for government to prepare for the establishment of ESA. But if the members across are now telling me that they are happy that ESA is not moving forward, then we are seriously going to have to review spending if we want to spend any further money mm. in a programme for government commitments the members opposite clearly don't wish to proceed with. I call Jim Allister. No schools have been deprived of funding. There has been a consultation, widespread consultation on the proposals for change. I, as I stated previously, I am delighted to report that 11,000 responses have been received from the main consultation and 3,000 responses from the tailored consultation for young people. I welcome the very high level of responses received. Clearly, it is going to take time to analyse and to summarise the key points. Jim Allister for supplementary. Uh, would the Minister like to explain to the parents of children uh, in all our constituencies who are not able to take up free school meals, why their children under his proposals should be less valued and have less financial investment than other children, since he is a minister who claims to belong to a party that believes in equality. And though he dodges the matter by pretending it is not a redistribution, it patently is, because that is the, going to be the impact on existing budgets. Redistribution of Department of Education funds. I never dodged that issue. And to create equality, sometimes you have to target resources specifically at one sector or group to create equality. You do not create equality by treating everyone the same. And if the member is serious about social deprivation, and if the member is serious about deprivation in working class Protestant communities, the best way out is through education. And if I have already pointed out, a child on free school meals is exactly half as likely to succeed in education as a child who is not. So if the member wants to get flustered, the member wants to get angry, get angry about that, and then you might be able to resolve something. And that is the, that is the end to questions to the Minister of Education.